ágæta doktorsefni, virðulega andmælendur, góði gestir. Hér fer fram doktorsvörn við læknadeild. Ég heiti Kristín Brím og fyrir hönd læknadeildar býði ykkur velkomin til þessarar aðtafnar. Það er Berg frá Baldursdóttir, sjúkurtjálfari sem er doktorsritkjör sína, jafnbæðistjórnun og áhrif skinnþjálfnar, óstöðugt eldra fólk og einstaklinga sem hlóti að hafa únleysbrot við byltu eða á ennsku, Postural Control and the Effects of Multisensory Balance Training, Unsteady Older Adults and People with Fall-Related Wrist Fractures. Umsjónarkennari var Dr. Pál Mefa Fjónsson, Professor Lækndeild. Leiðbynandi var Dr. Ella Kolbrún Kristinsdóttir, Dósent Emeritus. Og auk þeirra sátu í doktorsnefnd Dr. Benjólfur Árni Móansen, Professor Emeritus, Hannes Petersen, Professor við Lækndeild og Susan L. Whitney, Professor við University of Pittsburgh. Andmælendur hér í dag eru Dr. Fredrik Sjönström, dósent við Háskólinn í Lundi og Dr. Þórarinn Sveinsson, prófessor í Lífeldisvæði við námsvöld í sjúkurþjón við læknadeild Háskóli Íslands. Nú nokkur orð um doktorsefnið. Berg frá Baldursdóttir er fættar við 1961. Hún leik stúdensprófi frá Menntaskólinn við Hamraðið 1980. BS prófi frá námsvöld í sjúkurþjálfun Háskóli Íslands árið 1984 námi í stjórnun og rekstri í heilbrigðistjónustu 2003 og meistranámi í líf og læknavísindum við Háskóli Íslands árið 2006. Bergur á hlaut sérfræðilefi í öldunarsjúkurþjálfun árið 2009 og hóf dóttorsnám við læknadeild Háskóli Íslands í lokaðs 2013 og hefur stundað það samhliða sjúkurþjálfun á störfum en Bergur á starfar á byltu og beinvendamóttöku og göngudeild sjúkurþjálfun á landakoti auk þess sem hún sinni stundakenslu við læknadeild Háskóli Íslands. En nú er komið að loka skrefinu í doktorsnáminu sem er doktorsvörn hennar í líf og læknavíðstum við læknadeild Háskóla Íslands. Doktorsvörnum fyrir fram á ennsku og ég mun nú skipta yfir í ennskuna. Dr. Sjönström, I thank you very much for coming all the way from Sweden to lend your expertise and academic skills to these proceedings. And Professor Thorin Sveinsson, of course you are also to be thanked as well, even though you only traveled from Hafnafjörður. Um, I have briefly introduced the subject before us today, the doctoral thesis, the doctoral candidate, the supervisors and the doctoral committee. Uh, the doctoral defense is conducted in such a way that the candidate will first give an introduction to the thesis and her work. Uh, subsequently, I shall call upon the opponents to conduct the examination. According to the rules of the university, members of the audience can be allowed to speak if they have notified the Dean 24 hours in advance. So no such request has been submitted. However, brief questions or comments can be allowed from members of the audience at the end of the examination. But now let us start the proceedings and I give the floor first to the doctoral candidate, Bergþra Baldursdóttir, to present her work. Gjörs vel. Head of Physiotherapy, Doctor Committee, Components, Dear Guests. I would like to start by thanking the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Iceland for accepting my thesis for a public defense today. In my research project, I investigated the characteristics of people who had fallen and broken their wrist, and also the effects of a multisensory balance training among older unsteady adults and people who had fallen and broken their wrist. My doctoral thesis is based on three original research papers on the above topics that all have been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. In my talk today, I will start by giving an overview of the research background and present the overall research aims. I will then go through each of the research papers, present aims, hypothesis tested, methods, results, and conclusions. After that, I will revisit the hypothesis tested and present my answers to them. 
I will end my talk by briefly, briefly present my thoughts on clinical relevance on, of my research and future perspectives. But first, some background. The human upright position is unstable from a biomechanical point of view, and in order to withhold it, slight to moderate coordinated muscular activity is needed in the so-called postural muscles, especially the calf muscles. The muscles they receive commands from the different sensory systems. The, there are important sensory receptors in the, in the lower limbs that give information regarding position and movement of the body and weight distribution underneath the soles of the feet. And in the inner ear, we have the vestibular system or balance system. It provides information regarding movements and position of the head in space with regards to gravity. And it takes part in activation of fall preventive movements and coordination of head and eye movements. And then the vision helps us to analyze our surroundings in order to avoid possible danger. Information from the different sensory systems are then integrated at several levels within the central nervous system. And based on these sensory information and past experiences, multiple motor commands are generated within the central nervous system for postural adjustment and movements. All domains involved in postural control are affected by age-related UGM changes, which accumulate exponentially with age. As these GTM changes progresses, imbalance and the incidence of falls increases. The consequence of, these, of those falls can be injuries and fractures, and uh, among those, wrist fractures. A wrist fracture is the, most first, is the most frequent first fracture among Icelandic women, with a sharp rise in the incidence between 45 and 60 years of age, and it has been reported to be a strong predictor of future fracture risk and forerunner to the more serious hip fractures. They happen later in life and can reduce the quality of life, increase health costs, and even lead to death. Diverse training methods have been used to improve postural stability and decrease the rate of falls. And according to an, a meta-analysis by Sherrington and co-workers, balance training as a single intervention can prevent fall. And according to a more recent syst syst systematic review and meta-analysis by Stephen Lord, exercise interventions can prevent fall-related injuries and fractures in people above the age of 60 years. However, it's difficult to determine the most effective training procedure as the programs differ in content, content and some trials include a mixture of different types of exercises. Kristin Stotter and co-workers, they found in their research that people with reduced vibration sensation in the lower limbs, they had increase, increased vibration-induced postural sway and unfavorable postural strategies. However, their vibration-induced postural sway gradually decreased during stimulus, lasting only 200 seconds or just above three minutes which indicated, indicated that to a certain extent, they learned to adapt their postural control responses with regards to the stimulation. And these results led to the idea that targeted sensory training might improve the use of mechano and proprioceptive impulses, resulting in more efficient control of posture. The same research team found a high incidence of asymmetric vestibular function among people who had fallen and sustained hip and wrist fractures. A vestibular asymmetric vestibular function is an unequal function of the vestibular system between left and right ear, inner ear. And it can provide inaccurate information on the direction and magnitude of head and body movements, which might cause under or over estimation of the avoidance reactions resulting in a fall and could thus be contributing factor to falls and fractures among the aging population. The association of vestibular symmetry with falls and fractures initiated the idea that the vestibular and fall prevention training could be beneficial for postural control and decrease the risk of falls. 
And based on previous men the previous mentioned studies by Kristen Stotter and co-workers, we developed at the physiotherapy department of geriatrics at Landspital University Hospital a new multisensory balance training method, and it was given the name the Reykjavik model. The exercises in this program, they are per performed in bare feet in order to stimulate sensation in feet. Throughout all the exercises, people are encouraged to pay attention to and control weight distribution on the soles of the feet in order to increase stability. I will now show you a short video to present the main content of this multisensory balance training. People are taught to use smooth, corrective motions at the ankles to control their posture and avoid high-frequency motions at the hips and upper body. Uh, fixation of gaze is practiced during head movement, which is a part of the function of the vestibular system. And they perform the exercises on firm surfaces and also on soft surfaces, which is more demanding. The exercises are done with eyes open, performed with eyes open and eyes closed. They practice their stability during head movements, both on firm and soft surfaces, and it is done with eyes open and eyes closed as well. Uh, stability is practiced during walking. They are constantly paying attention to weight distribution on the soles of their feet. And they practice stability during quick turns, both to left and right. And they practice fall prevention movements in order to, order to learn how to react to certain balance disturbances by taking a step to avoid fall. The primary aim of my thesis was to evaluate the effects of the Reykjavik balance training model among unsteady older adults and middle-aged and old people with wrist fractures. Secondly, to explore the characteristics of people with wrist fractures. And my thesis is based on three original research papers. The first paper was a pilot study of the Reykjavik training model among unsteady older adults and was published in the Journal of Disability and Rehabilitation. Pro specific aims in this paper were to evaluate effects of combined mechano and proprioceptive, vestibular and fall prevention training on postural control, functional ability, confidence in activities of daily living, and falls among unsteady older people. The research hypothesis tested in this paper where multisensory training improves postural control, increases functional abilities, confidence in activities of daily living, and reduces the rate of falls among elderly individuals. Participants with 37 older individuals with a history of unsteadiness, falls, and fractures. And the training consisted of 18, 18 supervised training sessions supervised by a physiotherapist, each lasting approximately 45 minutes, and the training period was six weeks, and the exercises were from the Reykjavik training model. Here you can see overview of measurements conducted pre- and post-training. Uh, participants answered the activity-specific balance confidence scale, where they rated their own balance confidence in 16 activities of daily living on a percentile scale from 0 to 100, Zero is, zero is no confident, balance confidence, and 100 is the highest possible perceived balance confidence. Functional tests were four. Low volume strength was measured with the five times it to stand test. Walking speed with the 30 meter normal walk with a turn. And they were as well timed during ascending and descending 11 steps. And balance was measured in a, in a smart balance master with the sensor organization test. And this test, it evaluates the subject's ability to make effective use of somatosensory, vestibular, and visual information, and ignore misleading sensory information. And postural control is measured on a force plate, and the six different sensory conditions, and composite scores from all the six different sensory conditions were used for analysis, a score of 100 in indicating no Postural sway and a score of zero indicating postural sway exceeding the limits of stability resulting in a fall. 
A number of, of falls were collected one year prior to training, during the training, and six months post-training. Here you can see the results. There are the different tests are here on the axis. Oops. Here, the different tests are here on the on the x x axis, and on the y axis you see results in seconds or, or scores depending on the test in question, and gray bars represent re, re, represent the measurements before training and black bars measurements after training. And for the SOT, the sensor organization test, and for the activity specific balance confidence scale, higher bars post training show improvement. And for the other tests, lower bars post training show improvement after the training. And there was a significant improvement in all measured parameters after the training. And there was as well, as well a reduction in, in the number of falls during the training and six months post-training. And as you can see from this slide, 34 subjects reported, reported falls one year prior to the training, six subjects sustained a fall during the training period, and seven during the following six months. So to conclude, combined vestibular, proprioceptive, and fall prevention training improve postural control, functional ability, and confidence in activities of daily living, and it might decrease the risk of falling among older people. The second paper was a case control study with the title Sensory Impairments and Wrist Fractures, and it was published in the Journal of, of Rehabilitation Medicine. In this study, we compared people who had fallen and broken their wrist with matched individuals without a wrist fracture. Specific aims for this paper were to investigate vestibular function, foot sensation, postural control, and functional abilities, and evaluate whether these variables are associated with fall-related wrist fracture. And the research hypothesis tested in this paper were Vestibular asymmetry and reduced sensation in the lower limbs is more common among 50 to 75 year old individuals who have sustained a wrist fracture than among those without a wrist fracture. And secondly, these individuals perceive greater dizziness, have poorer postural control and functional abilities and less confidence in activities of daily living than those without a wrist fracture. Thirdly, sensory and physical dysfunction is associated with aging. And lastly, vestibular asymmetry, decreased sensation in feet, and physical functions are independently associated with having sustained a wrist fracture. Subjects were 98 individuals aged 50 to 75 years, and all of them had sustained a fall-related wrist fracture. They were identified from medical records at the emergency department of Landspitali University Hospital and screened for eligibility from a total of 440 consecutive people during a 12-month period. And they were recruited for the study two to five months after the fracture. The controls comprised a convenience sample of 48 healthy individuals without a history of full-rated wrist fracture and they were matched according to age, gender, and weekly physical activity level during the previous 12 months. Here you can see an overview of the different uh, questionnaires and measurements conducted in this study. A set of questionnaires were used to gather information regarding health status, previous falls and fractures. They answered the activity-specific balance confidence scale, and also the Dizziness Handicap Inventory Scale. The Dizziness Handicap Inventory Scale is a 25-item questionnaire that quantifies the self-perceived impact of dizziness handicap on daily life. A, a score of zero indicates no dizziness, and 100 is the highest possible perceived dizziness handicap. Functional tests were the, the the five times sit to stand test to measure strength in the lower limbs, and walking speed was measured with a 10, 10 meter walking speed. And the uh, balance measure was the same as in the case control study, it was in the sensor organization test in the smart balance master. 
Then there were three different tests used to measure sensation in feet, mechanoreceptive sensation, and one uh, test, the HEDSEC test, to assess vestibular function. Here you can see pictures from uh, measurements of sensation in feet. Uh, tactile sensitivity was measured with monofilament, 20 monofilament, all of them of the same length but different uh, thickness or stiffness. And uh, it was measured on three weight bearing points underneath the soles of the feet. And the thinnest possible monofilament that the subject could sense was the pressure threshold, and it was measured in grams. Vibration sensation was measured on the same weight bearing points underneath, underneath the soles of the feet with a biothesiometer. And uh, the lowest possible vibration that the subject could sense was, this, was the vibration threshold, and it was measured in micrometer. Uh, vibration sensation was as well measured with a clinical tool, a tuniform. And it was graded from one up to three, depending on the site where the, the person could sense the vibration. Symmetry of vestibular function between left and right ear was investigated with the head shake test. The test was performed in lying, and the participants were wearing goggles with a video camera inside them. The head was shaken from side to side at an intensity of approximately 2 hertz for 20 seconds, which stimulates the vestibular, the vestibular system. And post head shaking, the eye movements were video recorded. The test was considered positive for asymmetric vestibular function if two or more fast eye beats occurred, that is nystagmus. And the fast phases were towards the side with higher function. And all recordings evaluated <clears throat> were evaluated by an ENT specialist that was blinded to whether the recordings were from wrist fracture patients or controls. <clears throat> Here you can see characteristics of participants categorized by groups, and there was a significant difference between the wrist fracture group and the control group in all measured parameters except for vibration sensation. Thus, <clears throat> the fracture group had sustained significantly higher number of falls the previous 12 months and total fractures over lifespan. Their monofilament sensation was significantly worse. Their balance performance as measured with the SOT was significantly worse. They perceived uh, significantly higher dizziness handicap and less balance confidence than the control group. The incidence of a positive head check test was significantly higher in the wrist fracture group, and walking speed and lower limb strength was significantly worse in the fracture group. Here you can see characteristics of the participants categorized by age group. There was a significant difference in a, between the, the, the age groups were 50 to 58 years, 59 to 66 years, and uh, 67 to 75 years. And there was a significant difference between age groups in vibration sensation and in walking speed and lower limb strength. But there was no significant difference between the age group and other measured parameters. Logistic regression models were used to find the association of parameters with having sustained a wrist fracture. Model one included included function of sensory systems. Model two additionally included postural control. Model three additionally included perceived dizziness and balance confidence. And model four additionally included functional ability. Logistic regression models revealed that biothesiometer, monofilament and the positive head check test, sensory organization test composite scores, and five times sit to stand performance were significantly associated with being in the wrist fracture group. And in the final model, model four, biothesiometer, monofilament, and a positive head check test, and lower limb strength, the five times sit to stand test, were all significantly associated with being in the wrist fracture group. And of, of these variables, Positive head check test and monofilament sensation showed the strongest association with having obtained a fall rated wrist fracture. 
by having two or more fast eye beats on the, on the head check test, the likelihood of being in the restrictive group increased more than five times, and with each additional gram needed to sense pressure from the monofilament, the likelihood of being in the restrictive group increased more than almost four times. So to, to conclude, people with wrist fracture have a higher incidence of asymmetric vestibular function, reduced plantar pressure sensation, and poorer standing and dynamic postural controls, control compared with matched controls. And asymmetric vestibular function, reduced plantar pressure sensation are strongly associated with a fall-related wrist fracture and could be important contributing factors to falls and subsequent wrist fractures among the aging population. The third paper was a randomized control trial, and it was recently published in the journal Aging Clinical and Experimental Research. In this paper, we further studied the effects of the Reykjavik balance training model and among the people with wrist fracture from the case control study. Specific aims for this paper were to investigate whether multisensory training improves postural control, vestibular function, foot sensation, and functional ability among people with full related wrist fractures compared to wrist stabilization training. And hypotheses tested in this paper were multisensory training improves composite scores on the SOT vestibular function, sensation in feet, and functional ability among people with poorly rated wrist fractures. And secondly, potential changes after multisensory training are affected by SOT baseline composite scores. The subjects were divided, were randomized into two training groups, either into an intervention program consisting of current standard of care after a wrist fracture and multisensory balance training according to the Reykjavik model or they were uh, randomized into a comparison program which consisted of current standard of care after a wrist fracture and wrist stabilization training. Current standard of care includes treatment of the wrist fracture. Postural control is usually not evaluated. Patients are not taught exercises to maintain or improve balance to reduce the risk of future falls and fractures. The training consisted of six training sessions supervised by a physiotherapist and each lasting approximately 30 minutes. The participants received a written exercise program to be performed daily at home. They kept a home exercise diary during the training period as well. The measurements uh, conducted pre and post training were the same as uh, conducted in the, pile, in the case control study with one additional measurements of vestibular function, the video head impulse test. The video head impulse test was used to assess the function of the sem semicircular canals in the vestibular system. It measures the ability to keep eyes still during passive sudden head movements. The main measure of the canal function is the, is the ratio of the eye movement response to the head movement stimulus, that is the gain of the, ocular, of the vestibular ocular reflex. Here you can see some pictures from the intervention program. And uh, the home exercise kit in, consisted of a balance pad. And some pictures from the comparison program, the wrist stabilization training. The wrist stabilization training consisted of strengthening and coordination exercises for the fractured wrist. And the, the exercises were performed in sitting in order not to stimulate control of balance. And you can see a picture of the home exercise kit here, and also the exercise diary. Uh, the groups were largely comparable at baseline, except for vibration sensation, which was significantly worse in the multisensory training group. Here you can see significant within-group changes after the interventions, and there was a significant improvement in both groups in SOT composite scores and five-time sit-to-stand performance, the low limb strength. And additionally, there was a significant reduction in perceived distance handicap in the multisensory training group. 
Here you can see endpoint differences between groups in functional ability, sensation, postural control, perceived dizziness, and confidence after training. And the results show multisensory training compared to risk training based on linear models, which corrected for baseline values age and gender. And there was a significant uh, improvement on the SOT composite scores in the multisensory training group. But uh, no other significant changes were observed after the training. The participants in this randomized control trial, the risk receptors, they were quite healthy and well functioning. And for 84% of them, they scored at or above age-related norms on the SOT test. So we, decide, we decided to, to conduct a sub-analysis using only those participants who with scored below SOT baseline values regarding age. And it revealed that the multisensory balance training program uh, it revealed that the multisensory balance training program appeared to be more effective in improving 10 meter fast walk, 5 times sit to stand, monofilament sensation, and sensory organization test performance. However, there was a significant improvement on the sensory organization test as well in the risk stabilization training group. But it was 9.5. It was very close to learning effect due to repeated measurements with our eight scores. However, the multisensory training group exceeded that with 16.8 scores post training. So to conclude, multisensory training improves posterior control among people who have sustained a fall related risk factor. And the results of the study further suggest that the program is more effective for those with balance scores below age-related norms on the sensory organization test. I will now re revisit the hypothesis tested in this project and first go to the hypothesis tested in paper one. Multisensory training improves postural control, increases functional abilities, confidence in activities of daily living, and reduces the rate of falls among older individuals. And the answer to this hypothesis is yes. And for paper two, vestibular asymmetry and reduced sensation in the lower limbs is more common among 50 to 75-year-old individuals who have sustained a wrist fracture than among those without a risk structure? And the answer to this hypothesis is yes. These individuals perceive greater dizziness, have poor postural control and functional abilities, and less confidence in activities of daily living than those without a risk structure. And the answer to this hypothesis is yes. Sensory and physical dysfunction is associated with aging. The answer is yes for vibration sensation, strength in the lower limbs, and walking speed but not for postural control as measured by the SOT, perceived dizziness and balance confidence. Vestibular asymmetry, decreased sensation in feet and physical functions are independently associated with having sustained a wrist fracture. And the answer to this hypothesis is yes. And for paper three, multisensory training improves composite scores on the SOT, vestibular function, sensation in feet and functional ability among people with wrist fractures? The answer to this hypothesis is yes. Potential changes after multisensory training are affected by SOT baseline composite scores. The answer is yes. Individuals that score below age norms improve more in fast walking speed, lower limb strength, pressure sensation, and SOT than those scoring at or above age norms, but not for other variables. So my overall conclusions from all the three papers are the following. People with wrist fracture were shown to have risk factors for future falls and fractures. They should therefore be screened for fall and fracture risk besides fracture treatment. The multisensory balance training program, the Reykjavik model, improved postural control among older and steady people and among middle-aged and old individuals with wrist fracture. The results further suggest that the Reykjavik model can reduce the rate of falls among older people with a history of multiple falls. 
and my thoughts uh, on clinical relevance on, of my findings and future perspectives are the following. Factors in this study, which were found to be strongly associated with fall related risk fractures, could be used to screen for fall risk and identify those who are in need for further assessment and treatment. And the individuals who are considered to benefit from a fall preventive service should have, have access to an evidence based balance training program such as the regular model. And it uh, would be meaningful to explore further the effect effectiveness of the multisensory training program, the regular model, both among unsteady older adults and among other patients group. This project received grants from the following funds, funds which I'm very grateful for. And I would like to end my talk by thanking the members of my doctoral committee for their continued support and encouragement along the way. And I thank all of you for your attention. Thank you, Bergfara, for a clear presentation and a nice overview for your, of your work. And now we come to the examination by the opponents, and I'd like to start to invite Professor Schenström uh, to the podium. The floor is yours to examine the candidate and discuss this thesis. <coughs> Right. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank the University of Iceland for inviting me to oppose on this thesis, and I would like to thank the supervisors to get an, a, a doctoral candidate who does the actual work, and thank also for, for uh, Professor Svensson. I know I'm supposed to uh, expect to talk about the importance of Berg Tora's uh, work. And this is a very important thesis. And why is it? Because falls and fractures are very common. And in Sweden, where I come from during 2010, we had a lot of deaths just because of they had a, a fall accident. Actually, five times more than traffic-related deaths. And a lot of people were committed to hospital care. And a lot of lot of hip fractures and in Sweden this is only expected to increase because we have an aging population and if it continues to increase as it has been maybe we won't be able to afford other hospital care. The cost in Sweden it's, it's 2.5 close to 2.5 billion euro during one year and if you see on this diagram, most of the costs are actually not related to hospital care, but of production loss and daycare at home, which normally we don't measure. So it has a profound effect on the society itself. And where I come from, I'm a neuroautologist from the ear, nose and throat department. I use, usually deal with vertigo. That's our symptom. That's a very small portion of the patients who actually suffer from vertigo. A slightly bigger patients' population have dizziness as the main problem. But if you want to really address for the society, it is the fall accidents that we need. And if you look on an elderly population that has been hospitalized because of a fracture, actually the one year survival is 50%. So half of the patients dies within the first year. And that's considerably worse than most of the cancer that we have. And jokingly, a Christmas special edition of the British Medical Journey found that if you can walk faster than five kilometers an hour, you can outwalk the Grim Reaper and cheat death. And Bergtoria's uh, work in this field is 
is a very interesting, and she's shown an effect on an elderly population with um, her new model of training. And also investigated if it's possible to, if you do a quick intervention after first fracture, if you can find factors that could define the future for those patients. Right, now we're going to start the questioning, Maitora. And I, I noticed you, you changed the title for me from the first uh, draft that I got. It said unsteady elderly, and now you had unsteady older adults. So I, I apologize that I don't have the uh, correct one. Bertora, what is good postural control? <laughs> yeah, this, is a, this is a good question, and the important question. A good postural control is uh, when uh, the person is stable, it can, uh, it can be, yeah, in a, in a, in a circumstances that are challenging for, for, the, for postural control, for example, when slipping or tripping, the person would not, not fall, it, the person would uh, be able to react accordingly, ac accordingly or efficient way in order not to fall. And uh, it, the person would not uh, be unstable, though it, 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 even though they were, it was windy weather or, or, or somebody would uh, push the person, the person would be stable. Something in that direction would be my answer. An ability to perform everything that's... Every ability to perform everything, every, yeah. everything activities of daily living and being stable and, and not falling. Yeah. Does a line dancer, you know, the one who's performing trampoline acts high up in the circus arena, do they have better postural control than you and me? Yes, they have. And, uh, when, if you are if you are jumping on a, on a trampoline or you are you are turning in diff, you are taking turns in all kinds of directions, you are stimulating your vestibular system mm. in uh, in a heavy way. Yeah. But it's even more important for them not to fall, I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this um, Reykjavik model is uh, very nicely described in your thesis, and it's a very good video material. Uh, and um, what makes the Reykjavik model unique? Uh, it's not only training in bare feet, uh, I guess. Or, um, in you, would you expand it? Because it's an interesting concept, I think. Yeah. It is, it is important when you are training, when you are uh, training posture control, then it's important to stimulate all aspects, all the systems, the different components that are, that are important in the control of posture, both to stimulate uh, and train the sensory systems and also the, the, the motor part of posture control, and also uh, the integration of sensory information in the central nervous system. And the regular training model uh, takes all of the, all of the different parts, that, the components that are important in the control of posture. Uh, all of them are trained, and that both the, the sensory systems, the motor system, and the integration of sensory information in the central nervous system. And that is uh, something special for this program. There are many programs that uh, are mainly focusing on. Uh, and uh, training of muscle, muscle strength, mm -hmm. and uh, yes, and uh, for example, there are there is a west, west, vestibular training. This is mainly focusing on on, on on training of the vestibular system, but this uh, model is uh, not only training the, mod the vestibular system, but also the the the, the effective use of some of the sensory information. Information from the vestibular system and uh, from uh, all the from vision as well, and yeah, mm. this is the, what makes the, the program special. And there are there are not many programs that where people are are, are uh, performing the exercises in bare feet. 
Uh, we, but you um, didn't think of um, having some uh, shoe inlays or something to enhance the proprioception? It's not. No, no. I have not done, done it in, in uh, among my participants. Uh, they have been in bare feet, and uh, the thought is that you are more sensitive, for example, if, if I compare to, to, to the hands. Mm. We are more sensitive by, when we are with bare hands, not uh, using thin gloves, for example. Mm. The same goes for the feet. You are more sensitive in, in bare feet than wearing thin socks. You can better feel where the weight, where the weight distribution is and control weight distribution and the source of the feet. It's very important to, be, to, to keep stability. So now your patients were walking around on Iceland in bare feet. <laughs> yes, yes, many of them, and I encourage them to, 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 to not wear socks and shoes at home if they are comfortable with it. Mm. That's, that's a good idea. I especially like the last training where you're walking around and looking at different things because yeah. that's, that's really mm -hmm. a daily life. Yeah. To and also there are, there are so many of them that uh, have uh, reported that when I, when I ask them or encourage them to pay attention constantly on, on, to the weight distribution underneath the soles of the feet, they said, I, in a kind of a way, I was better at touch to the ground. Yeah. And I had, it was more easy for me to perform the exercises. I, I, I could do more, more difficult tasks by focusing on weight distribution underneath the soles of, of my feet. That was really helpful at the advice. They, many of them have, have said that. Okay, thank you. Um, the posture control system, uh, Barifora, uh, you investigated the sensory systems. Uh, the proprioceptive and the vestibular system with many tests, but you didn't examine vision. Uh, uh, actually, I did. You did? It okay. was not included in my paper. Okay. Uh, we, to, to begin with, I would like to say that uh, uh, there was no reporting of, the, of difficulties with vision from the participants. Uh, all of them, some of them were using glasses. They were well functioning and they could read. They had no problems with reading. And uh, they were active in the community, driving, running, walking in, in, the, in the case control study. Mm -hmm. And uh, but we, maybe I could show sure. a slide. See? It. Yeah, this one. Uh, we contacted the rod and the rod frame test. Yes, okay. And uh, it was used to perform, it was performed to assess symmetry of function in the right and left vestibular otolid organs. And uh, it was not performed exactly like uh, on this, at the, as, as in this picture it was, uh, the rod was projected to a wall from a computer and uh, the participants were seated one and a half meter away from the wall. And they had a remote control in their hands and they, they were supposed to place the rod vertically or horizontally four times. And, uh, and if, if there was asymmetric function in, in the autolith system, then the rod would be de uh, deviating away from, from the, uh, towards this, the, the autolith system with less functioning. And then they were supposed to do the same with this frame and uh, it gives an indication whether they are visually de independent. And uh, if they are, they are, uh, they are exact in the, 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 if their performance is the same by only having the rod and when the frame is there, either rotated to left or right, 
if the, their performance is the same, then they are not visual dependent. They are able to use uh, information from the autolith systems. Mm. So we did that both in the phase control study and also in the uh, random control trial. Okay. Uh, it's, it's um, a very important aspect to, to see the, the importance of the different sensory system if you're yeah. relying yes. on vision or... Mm -hmm. ah. There was not a significant difference uh, between the, the, the risk receptors and the controls with in, in all, in, neither in the rod test or the rod frame test. Yeah. And uh, both groups were well within the limit, limits regards as normal and less than three, of three degrees deviation. And uh, maybe, of course, I can see afterwards it would have been informative for the reader of uh, paper two that know this, but it was not included in, in, in the case control paper, paper two. And then I also analyzed it uh, after the training. And, uh, huh. and there was a significant difference in uh, the uh, rot here uh, to the right in the multisensory balance training group, but not in the average stabilization training group. There no significant difference, not in the rod or the rod frame to left and right in the wrist stabilization training, but it was in the, uh, in when the rod was uh, rotated to right yeah. after multisensory training. But these results have, have not been published. No. Okay, that's very good. Did you examine the, the ocular motor system as well? No, I did no. not do that. No. Um, sometimes in the elderly, they, it's very um, there's a grave dysfunction in in the smooth yeah. pursuit, and that's maybe is yeah, also pursuit, important. Measurements of smooth pursuit was not uh, included no. in no. my measurements. No, you you've done many tests anyway. Yeah. So. Um, could you? Put yes, my of course. That's very good. Um, these are your, the circumstances in which the falls happened. And you measured sensory function and the feedback posture control. Many of your patients slipped on wet surfaces and on ice, half of your patients, and 40% tripped. And how important is feedback control if you suddenly slip? Or Feedback control is very important. It's very important to, that if you slip or trip, uh, fast, corrective postural, uh, motion, fast corrective postural motions are very important. And they are, <coughs> they are triggered by a combination of uh, information from the mechano, from mechanoreceptive systems and also from the vestibular system. But in a, in a slip to in the vestibular system, it's very important to get information from the vestibular system when you trip or slip in, a, in fast correct, to, to trigger fast corrective preventive motions. The vestibular system provides information regarding position and movement of the head and the information regarding the magnitude and direction of head and body movement, movements and the, uh, can you repeat your question? Question. I'm not sure I'm, I'm in the right. No, I, I'm, I'm thinking. Right <clears throat> if you if you know it's um, it's it's winter in Iceland and yeah. it's ice outside, uh, you uh, you you walk differently if you ha if you know it's icy or if it's not. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, I know you 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 are you are talking about uh, learning experience, learning. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you if you are aware of that uh, the circumstances are challenging for the, the control of your balance, you know it by previous experience. Yeah. Then you are more careful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you talk a lot of vestibular asymmetry, yeah. and uh, 
That is, if you have a different function of, of your left and right ear. Now, if you fall on your nose and you have a vestibular symmetry, let's say you have it on your left ear, you have a dysfunction of the left ear, in what direction would you have your wrist fracture? Which arm? It is, it is more likely that you would, you would fall towards the ear with less functioning. So you would, if you have a higher functioning in the right ear, you would, you would fall to, to the left. Why it's is more likely. Yeah, yeah it, it is because uh, the fall reactions, the, the vestibular re reflex is triggered by the vestibular system. And if you, the, there are information coming from the vestibular system, and uh, if, there are, if, there are, if they are inaccurate, you, you get the uh, inaccurate information regarding the, the, the magnitude and direction of head and body movements, and that could lead to an under overestimation of the fall, re, re, the fall avoidant, avoidant movements so that you fall. So, so if, I, if, I, if I have no function on my left ear yeah. and have a good function on my right ear and I fall forwards, what happens in the vestibular system? Then? Your nose function in your left ear. Yeah. Only in the right ear. There would, there would be, uh, you would uh, trigger fall prevent, fall prevent the movements on the right side. So you would put your right foot out. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I was thinking that I just fell. <laughs> and and uh, the right side would tell me that this, this is functioning, this is getting signals to the brain that I... This would signal, tell the brain that I'm falling towards, I'm turning in space if, it, if I get the information from the left. So that's why I would fall on the other side, as you said. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, and um, here we have the Danish minister having good function on both ears when she's tripping. <laughs> so she puts both her hands out because that's important. We need both hands. Unfortunately, Fidel Castro and Mugabe seems to have a vestibular symmetry. <laughs> so they, they put their hands out. Uh, I, have, I have a slide here on a, of a fall. Sorry, I hope the video will get better. Um, there are some things that I wonder about. Um, What's happening? What's his, what is he doing wrong, Maritona? I'm sorry for the quality of the video. I'm thinking, um, what's he doing? What's his focus when he steps out? Yeah, he's, he's holding on something in, yeah. in his hands. He's holding a cup. Yeah, he's yeah. focusing on something in his hands instead of focusing on, on what he's doing yeah. in his walking and turning. Yeah. And um, I'm thinking that um, he doesn't know that it's icy. It's uh, feed forward control is bad. Maybe he shouldn't been walking like that if, it's, if it's, he had known that was icy. And maybe not in his morning slippers. Because no. <laughs> um, accidents happen. Uh, and uh, if you have something in your hand, the most logical thing is to drop it and see that you land carefully. But he clings on to his cup. Uh, yeah. And that also affects how, the way yeah, he falls. So um, now I'm going to turn to paper two. Um, our plan is that I'm going to talk about paper two and, and the thesis. Um, and uh, this was published in a, in a good paper, uh, Meritora. Uh, I wonder about this um, um, figure that you had in, for paper three, actually. 
in the right corner I try to write where, uh, what I'm going to talk about. Oh, it can't be seen. This is a, a borrowed picture from Paper Free. Um, I wonder about the terms eligibility, inclusion, and exclusion. Um, you, you screened 440 40 persons for eligibility to be in the study. And that's, that's to, is that an, um, and then you write 219 did not fulfill inclusion criteria. What were your, your inclusion criteria? My inclusion criteria were they had to have sustainable risk structure. Um, they had to be aged 50 to 75 years. Um, You are, yeah, 50 to, 50 to 75 years old, have a sent a wrist structure in a four. Age and wrist structure. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, from these 440, 219 were yeah, Also, they, 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 they were excluded if they had confirmed diagnosis of, uh, from, the, from the central nervous system. Okay. So, uh, so I guess from these 219 that were not included, some were young and some were... Yeah younger or older, and also they had to be able to conduct the different measurements and uh, quest yeah, the questions I used. Yeah. So uh, they had to be able to stand for a certain amount of time for to, to be able to go through the sensor organization test in the Smart Balance Master, yeah. and had to be able to walk for a certain distance to, to be able to confirm the 10 meter walking test as well. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's always good when you, when you read these kind of studies to know what material it is and how many were excluded and for what reasons. Uh, because when I first read it, I thought, oh, half of the patients that had a wrist fracture in Iceland are very old uh, and either having a movement or, or a dementia, a movement disorder dementia. Okay. But it's many younger people. And, uh -huh. So, <clears throat> in your material, and you had 98 patients who had sustained a wrist fracture uh, two and a half months, two, uh, two to five months previously, and you recruited a control group. What, what do you think of the controls? What, I mean, and the, the timeline in these fracture patients. Do the controls represent the patients as they were before they had the fracture? Or, do you understand? Yeah. The, the, the controls, yeah, they would, uh, they, were at, they were at the same age, yeah. and they were paired according to uh, physical activity level, measured in, in, uh, in hours per week, the, last, the previous 12 months, and they were also uh, matched according to age and gender. And uh, with that regard, they were similar mm. to, the, to the risk factor subjects. Do you think by falling that the uh, patients in the risk factor had changed uh, Posture control system, or is it uh, when this you measure them? Is it is that that they've always been? Or that's the, I mean, is that the cause of why they fell in the first place, or do they suffer consequences that you measure later? They might have performed better when when I measured them after the fall be, because of previous experience from the fall. Yeah. Then they. They were aware of that there, there might be maybe something. Yeah, at least they then they they were aware of that uh, in in cer certain circumstances, uh, their balance could be uh, disturbed and leading to a fall. But that was not the 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 controls had not that experience. So 
I think I think I think you are asking of uh, uh, whether they had learned that from previous experience and therefore maybe they they were their performance were better on the different tests or at least in, on the on the SOT or uh, yeah. towards that direc direction. Um, actually, well, I'm wondering if if um, the key findings in your study, if that is the consequence of a fall, or if it's a consequence from falling, that you mean that they maybe they they are afraid to fall again and they they change the postural control. And yeah, it is it is a non -fem known feminine feminine, but. Yeah. If you if you fall, you can be afraid of repeated falling, and that can affect your uh, activities of daily living. You are, you you may be avoiding such circumstances that you know that are challenging for your balance control, and 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 by that you are not stimulating the different sense system, both the sensory systems and the motor system, as you would mm. by being more active. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, this is a very stupid question because the best thing would be to measure the patients in the fracture group before they fell, <laughs> and then and because then you would know if they f f uh, fall out of uh, uh, what you measure from. Uh, but it's it's a difficult study. Uh, uh, one thing I wonder about from your table one in uh, paper two is um, the big separation from these patients from the controls are that they had fallen. But there's also a big a difference in the body mass index. You see the controls were leaner. They had a 25 in BMI, and the elder ones had a 20, uh, the fracture group had 28. And the sensory organization test or the equitest, it doesn't take into account the weight and length of the of the person. And we all do look differently and we use our balance. Do you think this body mass uh, difference could explain the different performance? I don't think so, no. Huh? Well, I, I don't know yeah, either, but... It, no. In a, in a way, when you are the heavier you are, the more uh, the more pressure or weight is on on on, on your the soles of your feet. So in 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 a way, it could maybe be of a gain, but and just and and but I don't think it is like that. But I have not, not uh, thought about that the higher body mass index has, no. would have uh, no, it, it's faster control. You get so many significant values, so I understand that you, uh, it gets much. Uh, another thing that I, I wonder about, uh, Bertura, is that you, you say when you uh, talk about the patients that some had hypertension and also diabetes, but you say nothing about the controls. Uh, did, uh, I, and I guess then that they were healthy to 100%. Yeah, I... I gathered health information from uh, a, a questionnaire, yeah. and I, I asked them about uh, medicine intake, and from uh, the and they also brought uh, uh, written. As I saw the medicine medicine they were taking, and from uh, med medicine intake I could see uh, what they were suffering from, mm. and that was both from for the uh, risk factors subjects and also for the controls. Okay, so, so the controls didn't, because some of these, um, like diabetes or vitamin B12 deficiency, would, would affect sensation. In, yeah, in I, I would uh, like to show you uh, one slide. It's regarding uh, medicine intake. It's, it's okay. Yeah. okay. I, I just wondered. Uh, okay. 
Okay, maybe just skip it. Yeah. Um. You're fine. Should we skip it? Yeah. It's it's not an important issue. I just wondered wondered about the healthy controls. They were super healthy. Okay. Yeah. Um, you have you have very good tables in your thesis, uh, Bartora, and it's very easy to see what you've done. And I just uh, cut them and paste them back together. And you do you do quite a lot of lot of testing on on the patients. Mm -hmm. And you actually did more with uh, rod and frame and uh, visual tests. How long did the test take to do on one subject? Approximately 45 minutes. 45 minutes? Yeah. Okay. You're quick. Because it, it's many different tests. And you have everything in one room? Or? No, they had, they had to, there were two visits. Yeah. Because the sensor organization test was performed in another building. Okay. Uh, at the geriatric department of the university hospital. So they had to, there were two, two visits, yes. Okay. 45 minutes in the lab, uh, in the balance lab at the University of Iceland, and uh, then another visit, uh, it took maybe 20 minutes for the SOT yeah. test. So, so the, the, the subjects had a, try, a chance to relax, and uh, because it's so many tests, and uh, many of the tests need their participation. Uh, another question I had is that, did you randomize the test order? If you, the, no, or did I, you test everything I, I, in sequence? I conducted them in, in uh, the same uh, sequence yeah. for every patient. Yeah, because if you, because if you have a long test battery, sometimes the the one you do towards the end will get the worst result if it if it's if their participation is needed because of fatigue uh, and. Um, Many of these tests are actually that you ask the patients, can you feel this? Can you sense this? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, um, we call that subjective tests, because you, you do something to a patient, then they tell you what they feel. Are there any objective tests? Well, we answered, when we were answering the questionnaires about yeah. the balance, confidence, and uh, dizziness handicap, that is subjective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, um, tuning fork, is that subjective or objective? It is not as precise as the biothesiometer. Bio, bio yeah. Um, in a way, you could say that it's, it is not objective, but they are. I'm, I was grading it from, from one to one to three, according to the site where they can sense the vibration. Yeah. And before I tested, I, I, I allowed them to, to feel it on, uh, on a bone at the wrist. I, I, I think it's as objective as, as you can in, in a, in a, by using a clinical tool. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, but it is still a subjective test, uh, so you need the patients to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that could be a problem if you are the only one who do the assessment and the patient only gets to do it once. I mean, for, for consistency and to be really sure about your data. Is there any, a way that you can improve the objectivity of a subjective test. The op yeah, mainly mainly by practicing a lot before you start measuring, and I did that. Yeah. So I was doing it, performing it in exactly the same way for each patient, and uh, yeah, I think that is the main, the most important thing to train a lot be before you start measuring and also always doing it in the same procedure. Yeah. 
giving this the exact uh, instructions, the same instructions from from uh, a, a test to test. Mm. It's a it's a good point, and sometimes also you could have two good trained uh, testers or assessors that yeah, see if and, and see if they do. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, but you you in your thesis you talk about the interrate uh, reliability yeah. of the tests. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you clearly address this question. Yeah. Um, I'm still cutting into your table one. I like your I like that table. And the the sensory tests. Um, and if you look on the biophysiometer tests that you have and I compared it to a study that we performed in, in, in Sweden, not me, but uh, mm -hmm. others, yeah. uh, in an aging population, a young population. And what you get seem to be a very, very good, uh, they have very good vibration discrimination, your patients. Maybe it's a difference between Iceland and Sweden. Because so. you... The elderly here were about 65 to, to 80 years old, and they have a 4.8 and 6, while your patients had 1.4. So it's quite a good, seemingly good vibration perception. It's very interesting. Yeah, but also, I, f I found that vibration sensation was, uh, was a significant difference between age groups, yeah. and vibration perception. Absolutely. And yeah. the, the, the patients in, in Patel and, yeah. and the co-workers, they were, uh, at least uh, some of them were older than the participants in my case quantum study. Absolutely. And, and these young people, they were really young. They were 20 years old. So. They were 20 years old. Yes. So, so it's a big difference. Yeah. I just find it interesting because what's, what you want to... When you have so much data, you want to compare it with what's happening in other places. It's interesting. Uh, what I do like to ask you about this Semweinstein test of monofilaments, mm -hmm. and you measure it in grams of the force that is, is applied. And I wonder, and I give you this table, it, there's one problem in using this test as I see it. And um, can you see that? If I have made it red, the target force grams for the different filaments. Is it something that springs to your mind when you look at it? Or maybe you looked, in, looked yeah. at it too much, but it... No, yeah, maybe I... Would... Sorry. By using grams, there is, yeah. it is more exact. If you would have used the number of the, of the different monofilaments, are you? Yeah, you, you, you use I grams, use grams. Yes, use yeah, grams. yeah, yeah. The, the problem that I see it is that it's non-linear. Mm -hmm. You see it's 0.006, then 0.02. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> that means that you make large steps sometimes. And maybe the differences are not as big as they seem to be. It's like taking a, a ruler and you only get seven centimeters, 18, 30. I mean, you, you miss some measure points. Yeah. But um, it's well, the same I, as- I had a look at some previous studies and they had, they had used uh, grams yes. as uh, as measurement outcome, and I decided to use the same. I, I've, it's, it's good, but I don't think it's... I hope they will be better in the future. Uh -huh. uh, the question is, uh, the ABC, Activity Balance Confidence Scale, and the Dizziness Handicap Inventory, uh -huh. They were very significant differences between your, your groups. Um, but to me, they are very subtle differences. Even if you 
very different. Uh, a dizziness handicap score of 16 in my clinic, I would ask the patient, so you're feeling quite well. I'm used to have dizzy patients for, for, uh, that have 60 or 70. Uh, but what, still you get very dif uh, significant differences. But what do they mean? Yeah, a score of uh, a score of ten or above is usually an indication for for having a closer look at the at the, uh, the person, and uh, a score of sixteen to thirty four is uh, a slight diminished ability with regards to mm -hmm. perceived dizziness, and thirty six to fifty two is a is a mildly impaired ability because of perceived dizziness handicap. And the score above 54 are, are serious mm. impaired performance because of perceived dizziness handicap. Absolutely. Uh, and your, your patients, they, they, as you said yourself, they were healthy, young, active patients. Mm -hmm. But still you get a difference. Uh, in, in, if in a material that you measure these groups, you get significant differences between them. But if a patient came to you that had a fracture and had a DHI of 16, then you wouldn't really think, oh, you're very dizzy. No, but still you are dizzy. Yes. Uh, you, uh, you, are, you aren't supposed to be dizzy. No. No. They are very general, these questions in the dizziness handicap inventory. Some questions ask uh, if you get dizzy in a supermarket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people get dizzy in a supermarket. Some of them, yes. Okay. Me. But then you could, have, and yeah. you could also dig deeper into the, the answers and see which of the questions yeah. the, the person is, uh, is answering as, as, as having perceiving dizziness in, in, in the a special activity of daily living. Yeah, well, I, absolutely. Uh, I mean, even if you have, you, you reference to La, La Joie, 2004 in the activity balance scale. And uh, if you have an ABC score of less than 67, then you have a risk for falling. Uh, and uh, that's, um, that's way below your patients that had already fallen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's difficult when you, when you ask people, but it's, there's a definite differences in your groups, it's, which I find very interesting. Um, I would like to talk about the head shake test, since I'm an ENT doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and much of this material relies on, on uh, vestibulars. Uh, system. You get 82% head shake positive in your fracture group and 63% in your control group. And to me that's a lot. Uh, uh, and um, if you look at the patients that, uh, or different studies that has been done, uh, the prevalence of positive head shake test is actually lower in those studies. Because you had two nystagmus beats uh, that were positive or not. Do you think that's enough? Do you, what? Yeah. Uh, fast eye beats. Mm. Of, of fast eye beats after passive head shaking is generally considered uh, uh, dysfunctional and it is a sign of asymmetric vestibular function. Uh, there are studies where they have been where two or more fast eye beats have been used as a significant test for asymmetric vestibular function and also studies that have used three or more fast eye beats. And uh, I was aware of that when I was uh, analyzing my data. And uh, the ENT specialist uh, that uh, evaluated the, the head shake recordings, mm. he calculated every beat, every fast eye beat among its subject. 
Yes. So I was able to to conduct an, an analysis using both one fast eye beat, two or more fast eye beats, or three or, or three or more fast eye beats. And I would like to show you these results of this. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, and by by using uh, three or more fast eye beats, as is uh, here. Yes. Uh, the incidence of uh, po uh, post uh, asymmetric vestibular function and post effective test was uh, higher in in the tractor group than in the contra group. I think there's a significant difference. Yeah. Uh, by using two or more fast eye beats, uh, the incidence of uh, asymmetric vestibular function was uh, higher, 20% higher in both groups, and it was significant as I, as, as I did publish in my study. And I also can't use the number of fast eye beats, and there was a significant difference in number of fast eye beats between the fractal group and the contra group. So, so why did you uh, choose two eye beats? I chose two eye beats. It had been, I, I saw that from the logistic regression model that it showed the strongest association with having ob obtained a risk structure. And uh, my conclusions, in my conclusions, I, among, in my conclusion is that the people that are diagnosed with asymmetric vestibular, vestibular function they should be checked. They, they, they would gain from, from learning uh, vestibular exercises to, in, 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 to a, adapt to the asymmetric function of the vestibular system. So I think it is of gain for, for the, the, pay, the people that fall and fracture their wrist hmm. that we use uh, two fast eye beats as a, as a significant test for asymmetric vestibular function. But, but it's a head shake test. Is that, and if you get two eye beats to any side, is that as asymmetric vestibular function that you're measuring? Yes, it is. C uh, couldn't it be a difference in the velocity storage mechanism in the brainstem? That you have a different activity in the vestibular nuclei in the brainstem that you haven't controlled or adapted to? That we had not adapted to, yes, it could yeah. be that. Yeah. It's, it's a, um, we have, um, uh, this was very, it, you, you get significant uh, um, differences also when using free eye beats as well. That's, mm -hmm. that's very good. Therefore, can you switch back to yeah, mine? Of course. Um, this is a sort of a test of the head shake test. Uh, and they correlated to function of peripheral vestibular function when they irrigate the, the ears. And they try to analyze how sensitive it is or sp how specific the test is for use diagnosing a vestibular dysfunction. And, um, Uh, it's, um, I think the results vary a lot uh, in, in quite many studies and they are old. And in some, do you know the difference between specificity and sensitivity? If there is a high uh, specificity, you are, you are um, correctly identifying uh, patients that don't have yeah. asymmetric vestibular function. Yeah. And, but, uh, uh, less sensitivity, you could overestimate the the number of <coughs> patients that are that are uh, diagnosed as having asymmetric vestibular function, but they, actually they are not having it. Yeah, and <coughs> and if you look at one one of the sensitivity slides, it's Sane et al. You see him; him. he's only have almost have ninety percent in sensitivity. 
they claim in their conclusion that although the direction of the head shaking test does not always accord with the side of the peripheral vestibular dysfunction, it is an indicator of vestibular dysfunction. And I just, just don't understand it. It's very difficult to understand. I think we need to learn more about the head shake test. Um, this is another head shake test where they correlate with canal paresis when you irrigate the ears. And this is made by Cambridge, from the Cambridge University, so you would think they are good. And they find if you have a severe canal paresis, that is, nothing happens when you irrigate the ear, only 36% of those have a positive head shake test. And it's a it makes it very difficult to interpret what is a positive head shake test. The only thing, though, is that they performed their head shake test with the eyes closed. And do you, do you know what happens when you have the eyes closed? The eyes goes up. It's called the Bell's, Bell's phenomenon. So you, you can't measure it. I don't, it it's a lot, I'm, I'm very confused of the head shake test. Maybe you're right that it is a vestibular asymmetry. Could you correlate your findings with head shake with your head impulse test and maybe rod and frame? Or do you... Yeah, it could be a source for paper, uh, yeah. paper four. And if, and, okay, so you find correlations between it? It's, no, I, 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 have not, I have not conducted that analysis, but I could do it and, and maybe present it. No, it's, paper. That would be a good, very good paper, I would say. Okay. It's needed. Head shake test and head impulse tests, it's needed. Okay. So, um, you explained this table four to me. Um, I get very <coughs> confused by this table four in your second paper. Uh, do you mean that these factors that gets significant, that they, they have, it's a synergy effect to, to have predict a fall in the future? Uh, is, oh, is I think, uh, what I just, I can, I'm almost done. But, uh, I think you have very significant differences between your gr two groups, but they are very subtle. It's not a big differences but they, they are significant because you have a very good mm -hmm. collection of data. And um, I think that's very important to see that it's, um, it could be a synergetic effect between having a symmetry of vestibular function and poor mm -hmm. uh, sensation. And uh, I would like to have preferred to see a multivariate analysis that you could combine the different factors and see if it's uh, predictable. The, um, so in the future, because um, what you really find later on um, is that maybe it's not good to treat everyone you see. Uh, but you, you still need to find the patients that you want to to treat, and what is the best screening test in your experience? What would be the? Well, I, I find the SOT test very useful. So, I, uh, I try to contact that on all my, my patients that uh, are able to go through it, uh, and I also, I, I test the sensation in feet. I have been up to now using the tuning fork in my assessment, but uh, recently I started also to use the biothesiometer, and uh, I'm going to implement the head shake test as well in, in, in my clinical work. Uh, well, I'm thinking of the, in, in the emergency ward, when your patients come with a wrist fracture, they reposition it and you get a bandage. Mm -hmm. And then they could fill out a, something that could say, 
yes, you should visit uh, Dr. Baldur's doctor because she's going to fix your balance. Yeah. I would, I would uh, start by asking them if they had the hist fallen often, not yeah. only this only fall, and also if they have a history of previous fractures. That would uh, give a strong, si strong uh, sign of that they might need further assessment. Uh, regarding some tests, I would, uh, it, it would be easy to, to perform the st five times to stand test. Mm and also see if they're able to stand and uh, close the, with their eyes closed. And if it uh, affects their control posture to, to move their head as well during standing, that would give an indication of they had maybe some problem with using information, sensory information from the vestibular system. So, so there should be assessment on the revisit of the patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sjöström. A man of Dr. Sveinsson came as a period, will you create a good land at Juft? Taya and Surakur, so who tell the local spectrum? Thora and Estimate. Skip on the tip. Tim Boyn. Gjörs vel, Þórinn. Thank you. Well, I would like to start to congratulate you on the thesis and the work you did. I think it's a very good piece of work. Uh, and uh, as with any good work, it answers questions, but it also raises a lot of additional questions. So it's um, partly my duty just to discuss these uh, new questions and, and how you have come to your conclusions. Uh, I'm gonna concentrate on the paper one and two and the intervention. So, um, Randomized control trial is, uh, what you would say, the golden standard or the, the highest level of, of uh, getting uh, evidence-based uh, treatment to, to support those. And uh, it's uh, very challenging to conduct a randomized control trial. And, and I don't think there is anything that would any randomized trial that would fulfill as a ideal or perfect, because there are so many different things that is both difficult to conduct and, and um, in, in a, a single study. So these are the things that I, I would like to discuss with you. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna go through these points that I have put up there and, and start maybe just, uh, uh, get your comments um, generally about your experience. I, I mean, I, I compliment you on taking on and publishing basically two intervention studies, one in paper one and the other in paper three. And uh, I'm sure that you uh, came across several challenges and pitfalls, as I say there, on your way through. So what, what is your, um, at this point now, you have stand here and defending the work, uh, what is the, um, y yeah, you first thought, what is your experience in, and, and what, what was, were you, uh, what were the main surprises you got and, and, and what is your general experience? Uh, the, the main surprises uh, were maybe uh, how little the, the people from the Rantum's control trial, the wrist receptors, how, how little they gained from the multisensory balance training program. Because the, the older adults in the pilot study, they improved in so many variables after the, 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 the training. 
uh, but then I saw that uh, uh, both the study population were different and also the protocols were different. Uh, the people in the pilot study, they were, they were older and frailer. They had uh, uh, several medical ailments compared to the younger and the more healthier subjects that participated in the randomized control trial. And uh, also the design of the training was different. There were 18 supervised sessions in the pilot study. Uh, however, but there were six supervised sessions by physiotherapist in, in the randomized control trial. And uh, uh, I realized that uh, the, the patient, uh, participants that uh, uh, participated in the randomized control trial, uh, they, they were so well functioning to begin with, even though they had uh, developed several factors that are related to falls and fractures. Uh, they were physically, physically well, uh, very, very good physical form. And they were scoring higher on all the different uh, measurements and tests. So that uh, made it more difficult for them to, to achieve improvement after the training. So I realized afterwards that it, it now that I have my results, results, it would have been wise to have some more inclusion criteria into the training part. Uh, after the case control study, it would have been wise to have an yeah, inclusion criteria, for example, reduced sensation in the feet or uh, impaired uh, balance control, something like that. That would have increased the likelihood of, of them gaining more from the multisensory balance training program. Yep. And, yeah. and then uh, regarding the number of uh, training sessions, uh, it was, uh, I used 18 training sessions in the pilot study, and it was based on the, the uh, social security reimbursement rules in Iceland at that time. Uh, its referral included 20 reimbursed sessions, training sessions, and uh, that was the reason for, for me to choose t 20 training sessions. I used two, at uh, 18 training sessions, I used two for pre and post measurements, and then 18 for the training. And then I reduced the number of uh, supervised sessions in uh, the randomized control trial, and that was based on uh, my experience uh, from the clinic. I had been I had been treated patients that had uh, uh, had uh, reduced uh, vestibular function, both uh, unilateral and bilateral vestibular function, and uh, they gained from six supervised sessions. They improved on the SOT and and their balance perceived dizziness handicap reduced as well, and uh, those patients were referred to me from ENT specialist, and they were. Aged uh, from 50 and up to maybe 65 years, and uh, that I, I I thought that uh, and they also uh, they also performed home exercises as well. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be uh, wise to to try that in the random control trial. Good, thank yeah. you. That's that's. Uh, you already touched on a lot of the the, the other points that I'm going to mention okay. or discuss, and and the the, the first uh, is like the selection criteria, and you already mentioned that you m may rethink that, or afterwards you mm -hmm. you see that uh, you may have done differently. Uh, there are both, uh, yeah, uh, when you design a randomized control trial, it's, it's uh, I mean, this is just one thing that you have to think of. I mean, who are you going to include and who, who not? And one thing I noticed, like, for, for the, the, uh, the study in, in paper three, that uh, you excluded uh, quite many people because of, like, Parkinson and degenerative 
neurological diseases, didn't you? I mean, that was, what was the number again? Pardon? Uh, uh, what was the number that you excluded? I think it was over 200 in, in that you excluded mm -hmm. yeah. because of, of were, they, were they all like, how many of them were, for example, uh, with Parkinson or what diseases were there? Yeah, I, I really can't recall. It was, uh, it was uh, the orthopedic, the Brindula Mosin who, who uh, who went through the, the patient's files and uh, found those that uh, fulfilled the inclusion criteria. Yeah, yeah okay, uh, that's fine. I, I, yeah. Just, I just uh, saw that uh, interesting or, or um, high number. Uh, but I, I also wonder why did you exclude those? Because uh, in your um, thesis, you talk about uh, balance training uh, will uh, there are studies that show that balance training benefits, for example, uh, Parkinson, people with the Parkinson disease and things like that. Uh, why did you then exclude those? Uh, was there any particular reason? Yeah, the, the, the main reason was that, was that it, the more comorbidities, comorbidities that they had uh, achieved, it uh, would have affected their uh, overall performance. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And I wanted to exclude as many, uh, if I can use the word, co-founders when I was, when yeah. I was uh, 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 when I was estimating what Carter, what carterized people that uh, had sustained a risk structure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, 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 that's a valid, valid point. But uh, still, I mean, then you, your conclusion is only about rather healthy, as you already have mentioned. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, uh, in in paper one, did you was the same exclusion criteria there regarding like neurological diseases or? No, I included. Uh, Everyone, everyone that uh, could go through the multisensory balance training program, mm -hmm. uh, except for those that uh, were cognitive impaired, mm -hmm. because people <clears throat> they have to they have to understand uh, uh, what they are supposed to do in in the, in the training, and uh, that was the reason for excluding people that they were cogn cognitively impaired. Otherwise, and they had to be able to, to go through the different measurements and, and also the training as well, but especially the, 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 especially the measurements before and after the training. Mm -hmm. But I did not exclude those with the, the confirmed diagnosis from the, West, from the central nervous system. And uh, that, I'm, I'm glad that I, I didn't do that because they gained from the multisensory balance training yeah. no less than the people that uh, had no confirmed diagnosis from the central nervous system. And that, that, that gives an indication of that the multisensory balance training program could, the people that uh, have uh, confirmed diagnosis from the central nervous system could gain from the, trip, from the program. Exactly, yeah, that, that's basically the, the point I was trying to get. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, control group. Uh, you didn't have any control group in paper one, but paper three, you, in, uh, three, you included um, control groups. So I, I just wanted to uh, have you some uh, thoughts on that. Why is control group important? And, and what do you gain by having a control group? Yeah, it is important to have a control group. It was a, it was a a limitation in the in the in the case control group not to have a control group. In paper one, one, you mean? Uh, right. In in the in in the in the uh, pilot study. Yeah. 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 Sorry. In the pilot study, there was a limitation not to have a control group, because then you a control group would uh, reinforce your uh, reinforce my uh, research uh, by showing that uh, if the control group maybe were only receiving, for example education or information regarding fall risk uh, or nothing, nothing, uh, something very dissimilar to what the multisensory training program includes, 
Mm -hmm. And uh, they would not gain from the training, but the contact group, but the, the multisensory training would gain from the training. That would reinforce my results, yeah. strengthen them. But I, I'm, I'm also thinking about uh, terms that we call placebo, placebo effect or learning effect and things like that. You actually mentioned learning effects in your thesis in one of your tests you use. Yeah. So uh, the control group is to... Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the control group is... Uh, yeah, can, can you repeat what you are asking about? Uh, the effect like we, we call placebo effect, yeah. and learning effect and things like that. Basically the purpose of the control group is try to control for this effect. Yeah. What, do, do, what do, uh, do we mean by placebo yeah, effect? Plas placebo is uh, you, are you are improving. Uh, there are some other reasons than, than the, the training that is explaining your uh, mm -hmm. better performance. You, it could be maybe because uh, the day when you were measured, the balance was measured, you were maybe worried, you had not slept well the night before, mm -hmm. something like that, that was distracting your concentration or your, and your performance, and, and press down, downloading, a, a pressing down your performance at the day that the measurement was conducted. But if it would be repeated maybe a, two or three days later, and you had slept well and were well functioning in good form that day, you would mm -hmm. perform better. I may, I may come back to that when I go get to some of the results. Uh, blinding, how important is, is blinding? And, and uh, quite often the um, researchers talk about uh, double-blinded studies, that's, that's very common, but actually the, the methodology says that you should try to have a triple blinding. And uh, so, uh, but unfortunately it's not always possible and there are several reasons why we cannot have that. Uh, could you just uh, tell me uh, um, what blinding you did use and, and why and why you didn't use others? What was the main reason for not blinding everything or use triple blinding? Mm -hmm. Well, what do, do I mean by triple blinding first, maybe? The triple blinding. Hmm. Or, or what, is, what is meant by double blinding, blinded study? Double blinding is, uh, uh, for example, I, double blinding is, uh, uh, for example, I was not, uh, I was, uh, for example, the ENT specialist, he was blinded to whether the uh, video recordings were from a fracture Fractal subjects, restricted subjects, or or a control. That is that is blinding. Pardon me. That is could, blinding. Could you the, repeat that? The ENT specialist that uh, evaluated the the video uh, head yeah. check test yeah. okay. recordings yeah. was Sorry. blinded to whether the recordings were from restricted subjects mm -hmm. or control. Mm -hmm. And uh, I conducted all the measurements before and after the training, and I was blinded to whether the patients uh, were. Uh, were uh, referred to uh, a wrist stabilization training program or to a multisensory balance training program. And then they came back for, re for be measured again. Mm -hmm. uh, I was still blinded to whether, where, where they came from. And, uh, but it was impossible to blind the patients for in whether they were going to participate in a multisensory balance training program or or a wrist stabilization training, as it is possible to do it in, in when you are when you are doing research with regards to me medication. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Inside pharmacy. So it's very difficult to. It's difficult blind to, the, to blind the, the, the participants the with regards yeah. to to the training part. Yeah. yeah. But uh, how how aware were the subjects that uh, about the purpose? of the treatment and which group they belonged to. Were they informed so they knew that they were in the group? They didn't know really what was the control group and what was the no, they, treatment? They did not know which group was the control group and, and, and which was the intervention group. So they didn't it really know if they, if they were in the group that would not benefit from the training? So, so that actually means that they were 
at least partly blinded to the yeah, effect in, in, of the in treatment. A way, in a way, you could yeah, say that, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think that's what we maybe say, semi-blinded to the, to the treatment if they don't really know if they're expected to benefit from the treatment yeah, or not. Yeah, in a way, they are yeah. blinded, yeah. yeah. But the, 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 the th th third blinding is, is even more difficult to do sometimes, uh, and that is the, the therapist, the, the one who is giving the treatment. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it's easy if you have, uh, have uh, like a doctor who is describing a, a drug, and, and he just describes the drug and gives the, the, the pill to this patient. He doesn't know if it contains the no. placebo or, or the real mm -hmm. stuff. But like in your case, it's, it's, it's very difficult, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's impossible. <laughs> it is impossible. Yeah. But do you, could, could you think of any uh, like a uh, treatment that a physiotherapist would uh, give his patient that you could uh, blind the, th the therapist? Yeah, I could do it by using a video. For example, there, there, there would not be the patient would not see the trainer. Uh, he would be watching video. Um, yeah. And where, where the demonstrate where the instructions regarding how to perform uh, the the intervention that was uh, that the, uh, when they were um, performing the exercises that were used in the in the particular uh, in, uh, study, uh, it could be possible to to do it through video yeah. without But seeing the the, the trainer. That's, that's one way. Uh, one, of th one thing that I was th came to my mind was when physiotherapists use uh, some like laser or something like that, and he doesn't know if the machine is turned on or not, then he's blinded yeah. for the effect. Because, uh, but what, what, um, uh, why would you blind the therapist? Yep. Why would I blind the therapist? I, maybe because the therapist uh, would uh, maybe uh, put um, greater attention to, to a particular patient than to another one. Maybe because he uh, liked him, the person more, or, or even though it's not professional. He wants to get positive results, positive, right? Positive yeah. results, yeah. yes. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually, Yeah, yeah. Let's move to the the next uh, the intervention, and 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 we you have already said a lot about that, um, and the, and the difference in the intervention between these two studies, and and, and like uh, regarding intensity and volume and things like that. And so it's very important to think. I mean, uh, you talked about that your guidance to that was partly what they got paid for or what is uh, practiced by the sugar drinker and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, you also have to think like, if you're giving a treatment, I mean, you, you, you want it to work and, and certain volume intensity, mm -hmm. intensity, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you have to think of that. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, You, uh, there was this one and the same therapist that gave all the treatment in each of the papers, right? In paper one. Was it the same in paper one as in ta paper two? Paper, uh, paper three, I mean. No. Uh, I myself mm -hmm. uh, supervised the training in, in the pilot study. In uh, paper three, there were two different physiotherapists. I, I, mm -hmm. I directed the training, but uh, there were two different physiotherapists that uh, supervised the training sessions. Yep. One that supervised the multisensory balance training, and another one that supervised the wrist stabilization training. Uh, why did you use just one therapist in each case? Uh, not using many therapists. Mm -hmm. uh, What are the pros and cons with that? Yeah, the, 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 the positive things, uh, thing about using the same therapist is that uh, uh, it's more likely that uh, the same instructions uh, are used for, for each patient and it also that the, the, the person itself, the, the effect that the, 
the therapist has on the patient, it is the same for every each of the patient. If you would, the, the negative sides could be that if there was different therapist, maybe they were not giving exactly the same information mm -hmm. to the patients. That could affect the results. And uh, yeah. But what are the negatives about that? I mean, uh, you were uh, testing a uh, treatment, mm -hmm. and you are not the only one that are in the future hopefully going to use that, or you want others to use that if it, if it is effective. Yeah. But if you give, gave all the treatment, how sure can you be that every, every other physical therapist will do it as good as you did? Yeah. Or, or the, the therapist you... you Right? So, so by using just one therapist, it, it reduces the transferability of the knowledge, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but I, I, mean, you, you, I mean, you can't do everything, so it, somewhere you start. So maybe yeah, the also, next step in, would in be... In the randomized control trial, it was impossible that I would conduct the measurements and also the training. That was not possible. No, no, I, I had to be blinded to whether they, in which group they, they went. Yeah. Yeah, as I, I said in the start, I mean, there's just so ma much thing you can do in one study. Yeah. And so you have to limit yourself, and you, you can't do everything in oh. one study. But, but this is just something to, to, to keep in mind. And, and, and yeah. What about the, like, uh, you, uh, as I understand that the, the trainings were, were uh, partly individual tailored, I mean, they were adjusted to each patient and mm -hmm. and, yeah. and uh, uh, what does that say about um, um, uh, did you keep track of what you actually used and uh, for each patient and and did you use all uh, I mean yeah for the one in the in the randomized control you had 38 right, right that went through them did they were they similar, or uh, did they use the similar exercises, or...? or uh... Uh, in the randomized control trial, the exercises were quite similar from, from participant to participant. Uh, but does that mean that you really didn't use all the, the, the exercises that you had on your list, or...? Not, not necessarily every no. exercise. Yeah. The, the list con uh, included many exercises, mm -hmm. and uh, there were some... Uh, yeah, they actually they, they, they conducted all all the all the exercises that were included in the multisensor balance training program, but at dif different uh, difficulty levels. Some of them may be on on uh, firm surfaces, others on uh, a foam, and, and in the supervised session on a trampoline as well, which was more demanding. And uh, some of them may be a lot of uh, exercises with eyes closed. Mm -hmm. The other more with eyes open, they had to be uh, individually uh, uh, performed, uh, individually constructed because uh, it was uh, they, they were supposed to be at the at the, the at, at the limits of uh, at the uh, as as uh, difficult as possible. Yeah. So that would gain as much from them as possible. So that maybe leads me to the next question about the, the how progression was uh, fulfilled in. So there was a, by that you, you, you could make sure that there was some progression in the exercises, right? Because yeah. mm -hmm. don't you think that's important? Very important. Yeah. Uh, and the, it is in, in, in the multisensory balance training as it is in, in, in all training, it is important that the exercises are difficult. They have to be at the limits of capability and sometimes above the limits of capability for the person to, to gain from the training. Yeah, and then when they are up to yeah. that, you have to yeah. progress, right? Yeah. And the better, uh, I think that in the, in the pilot study, the super session were 18. And the, so in every session, there's a possibility to, to add to the intensity of the training but in the random control trial, the super session were only six. Mm -hmm. So it was only six, six sessions where you could add to the intensity of the training. They were supposed to, 
to train at home and have it as difficult as possible. But it, it, it is not actually the same to train on your own with no trainer pushing on you mm -hmm. than, you, than, than, than how, how it is in, in a supervised session. Absolutely, yeah. Good question. Well, good answers. Uh, you mentioned a, lit, a little bit about uh, the adherence to exercise, and then I'm thinking about the, like the home exercises in the, in the study three. Uh, I wasn't quite uh, did quite understand. They kept diary of their home yeah, exercises, yeah. didn't they? But then you said, I think that you didn't really. You were not able really to um, uh, monitor their adherence, or did I misunderstand that? You misunderstood that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would like to show you. So, yeah, the, so that they, was basically the question. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, did they adhere to their home exercises? Yeah, they did. Okay. If I may show you. Mm. This is the, the, the diary. They were supposed to, mark, to put a mark uh, when they had performed their home exercise that day. And uh, I, I received all the exercise diaries afterwards. I went through them yeah. and I counted the numbers. Uh, if they had a full exercise adherence for the week was five times for the week. And uh, the, the weeks were 12. And I, I counted uh, their the, the number of, of uh, home sessions that they had performed, and the exercise, exercise adherence was similar between the groups, a bit higher in the multisensory training group, but uh, the difference was not statistical. Okay, good. Statistically yeah. different. Yeah, but that's good to see, yeah. because that's, of course, very important. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, then uh, is the outcome measures, and you and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Tjernström already discussed that a little, so I think I'll just go directly to the outcomes, but uh, uh, there is always, uh, I mean, you, you can't measure everything, so you have to be selective what you measure and, and what not, and, and actually you already discussed that, so I think I'm going to skip that and go into some of the outcome measures um, in paper three. And uh, uh, I, I have to uh, uh, apologize that I, I, I am going to go a little bit into statistics. Uh, I know you are a physiotherapist, but not a statistician, and I'm a physiologist and not statisticians. So I, I don't really expect you to uh, understand all or explain all the details of the statistics, but uh, when we do research, and as you were doing, I mean, we base it on objective measurements or subjective, but we get numbers and we do statistics. So uh, we, we have to understand the numbers, what the numbers are saying, mm -hmm. telling us, so, or, or, uh, uh, so we make the right conclusion from the numbers, right? So it's very uh, important that we, we uh, make sure that the statisticians or, or, uh, the, or the people that we, we consult, that they explain to us exactly what, what, what this means. But uh, before I start, uh, I understand uh, from your thesis that you, you did all your statistical tests your, yourself. Uh, and I'll start with the HST, head shake test, right? Uh, and this is from table 9 and 10, right? Uh, so table, table 9, you have 76.2% uh, and then 89.5% for the treatment group, for the MST group, okay? Uh, just to make sure this is percentages, right? So uh, the result of this test is just uh, plus or minus, yes or no, right? This, when you do the head shake test, there is only either yes or no. Yes or, or no to whether it is uh, 
a positive test for, yeah. for asymmetric. Yeah, asymmetric. Okay, so I, I'm just going to ask you first about this, uh, this, this number there, uh, p-value, 0.12. What, what test did you use to, to compare? That's comparing 76.2 and 89.5, right? Yeah, I, I, I also, in, in my uh, statistics... Sorry, this is more, but I just cut it out from your thesis. Yeah. I didn't do a really good job there, though. Yeah. I also, in some of my statistical analysis, used uh, the number of eyebits. Uh, just table nine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the difference between the group where, where the man with test or the, the you know, per sample t test. So, independent, so do you, independent do you know uh, which test you use there? In, in this particular? Yeah. I, I would have used the man with test as it, yeah. as it was not uh, normally um, But... Uh, these are by varied, uh, binomial variables, so because it's just yes and no. So I, I would probably have used uh, a different test there, like chi-square or logistic or, uh, regression or, or something like yeah. that, because it's uh, because Manwitney is actually uh, yeah. designed for uh, like an ordinal scale. Yeah. But that, that, that's okay. Yeah, that's not yeah, important. I, I would have to open my uh, my uh, output statistical yeah. output to to check. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, that, that, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I think the, uh, with this number, uh, 76.2 and 80.9.5, uh, chi-square test would give you a significant difference between those, I, th I think. Uh, well, actually, I'm quite confident it will. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the table 10, right? Uh, that's the difference in this number so I assume this means that in the restraining group, it's kept 76.2% after the training, right? But in the MST group, 89.5 decreased to by 15.8%, down to about 73%, right? Yeah. What I, I don't quite uh, understand, and it puzzles me a little bit, uh, the confidence limits for this number, 15.8. I, th I would guess, after uh, what's, uh, looking at this, uh, that you probably, there is a spelling miss error there. Okay. This should be 32% to 0.5%. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. And I'll, I also wonder, uh, uh, the p-value there just says that the percentage has decreased, uh, actually not significantly. No. From 89.5% down to it. Again, I think if you would have used the uh, binomial test, you would get that number significant, and also significant from the other group. Would that generally have changed your conclusion? I, I don't think so. But it would yeah, still it, have made your conclusion stronger, right? It would have made, made my conclusion stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then I would have, uh, could have uh, concluded that the multisensory balance training uh, had a positive effect on, on uh, the vestibular system on, on the incidence of positive head cell test. Yeah. I, I think that's quite possible, but that's that's positive, right? <laughs> uh, I should have consulted you during my statistical <laughs> analysis. Uh, then the 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 HI score. This is a dizziness scale, right? So. Uh, the score there is uh, type of line says what the score is in at the baseline, and then you have table ten which shows the changes, right? 
So the, the DHI score decreased 2.3 in the control group or your risk training group, which is your control group, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, the treatment group decreased on average by 4.7. Yeah. Uh, uh, minus 4.7 is signif signif significant, right? According to this table. Yeah. But what I, my question is, is there a significant difference between minus 2.3 and minus 4.7? Did, did you test that? Or? Yeah, I, t I tested that. Uh, th there was not a significant difference. In, 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 in this table? Yeah, I, I... Actually, I think you d actually do, you do, d do that mm -hmm. in table 11, right? In table 11, yeah. yeah. But in table 11, yeah, in table you 11, adjust yeah. for age and... Gender and, uh, and uh, baseline measurements. Yeah, so they, they are not really... I mean, they, they are adjusted in table 11, but not adjusted in table 10, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, okay, that's fine. But then we get to the final uh, outcome that I'm gonna discuss with you, SOT score. Uh, again, uh, table um, nine is the baseline values, right? Yeah. And table, table 10 is the difference in each group separately. And uh, so both groups uh, improve significantly, right? Mm -hmm. But here again, uh, you don't directly compare 3.58 and 4.22. You, you don't compare those directly. So you don't know if they are. No, not in this table. No. And if you look at the confidence interval, they, I would guess they will not be uh, significantly different. But then when you come down to table 11, you have a significant parameter there, B of three. Do you know what that number actually tells you? Yeah, they improved by, by three, three scores after the training. That is a significant. Bo uh, which both groups or? No, the multisensory balance training group. Compared to the other Compared one. Compared to the yeah. other So actually, uh, I think you're, uh, that's how I understand it also. Yeah. So actually the difference between three, po you see 3.58 yeah. and 4.22, the difference is what, about 0.62, right? So the difference of 0.62 suddenly becomes three. When you adjust for baseline values, age and gender. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was curious, uh, what was it really that changed this number point, point from 0.6 to three? Was it the baseline value? Because they are a little bit different, as you see. Yeah, in the, uh, the baseline values were, were significant difference yeah. in, uh, in uh, vibration sensation in the biothysometer. Yeah, no, I, I'm just talking about now about SOT test. SOT, okay, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's in the top, top table there, right, table nine. So it's 72 and 74. Yeah. And you are just for that. Uh, were, were there eight differences in the groups? There were. Uh, it's it's the, also in table nine. Yes, actually. table nine. Yeah. There were the the participants in the multisensory training were a bit older, but it was not a significant difference. Dif significantly different. Mm -hmm. uh, however, there were uh, <coughs> there was a significant difference between the gender, between the sexes. Yeah. Uh, the, the so that that uh, I mean. Um, uh, all these confounding factors could explain this change, mm -hmm, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but you're you're not sure which one was really involved, is that or not? 
which one? Uh, had a look at it. it was yeah. Uh, no, was that's fine. If you if you 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 haven't uh, answer as I say, I, I don't expect you to have all the statistical answers. Uh, but I think it was just uh, I think important just to to discuss this. And, and as I say, I mean you you have to make sure that you understand your numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although you don't understand the, the statistics behind it. Uh, I, I, I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> so I, I, a little bit about the subgroup. Uh, you uh, selected those that were below uh, normative values. Eight the norms on the SLT. So you only have eight and five in each group there. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you, you didn't really test, like, if you, if you just look at the SOT outcome, it's 9.5, as you said, and then it's 16.08 in the treatment group. And uh, uh, you didn't, uh, did you test if these two numbers are st statistically significant? Did you? Well, uh, it Did doesn't you, matter. What, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure I answer your question. I understand. I, I'm understanding your question. I'm, I was just wondering if uh, the you tested if the difference between 9.5 in this table and 16.8, that's the improvement in each of the two groups, mm -hmm. if these two numbers were statistically different. Uh, I'm not quite sure I did No, okay, it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, okay, we leave that. Uh, but you see that these numbers are much higher than the, the, the numbers in ta uh, table uh, 10, right? And you, you talked about that already. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, think about or consider uh, effect? Uh, it's always dangerous yeah. when you when you have dual measurements and then you select either the um, and you divide the group and you select the one that come lowest out of a certain score and then the highest and uh, there is a certain danger which is called uh, it's a kind of an artifact it's called regression towards the mean mm -hmm. have you heard about that yes i have uh, what do you, would you say about that re regarding these numbers yeah, I, Do you think that's uh, affecting your numbers there? I think there is a <coughs> uh, less probability of that affecting my results because I had a control group. Yeah. I think so. Or, or actually, uh, it's very likely that it will affect to the same extent your both groups. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it will affect both your groups. Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I can see here that uh, <coughs> I, it was not included in the table, but I, I, uh, I did a separate comparison between groups using lin linear regression uh, and I corrected for baseline values uh, and I found that the multisensory balance training had a higher endpoint SOT than the VT group. Yeah, okay, yeah, so that, that answers the question you had yeah. before, right, yeah, yeah. thanks, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, that these high numbers, 9.5 and 16.8, uh, are both affected to this artifact, which is sometimes called regression towards the mean. And, and you didn't adjust for that in your analysis. I did not. No, no that, 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 that's fine. But I, I think you already mentioned that you, you cannot, and, and you say in the thesis, you can't really draw a strong conclusion from this table anyway because you have very low numbers. Yeah. But this further uh, um, puts a, a, a little uh, doubt on, on, on what you can actually read from this table, I think. You agree, right? Mm -hmm. okay, good. I think I'm almost done. I had some additional questions. Some have already been raised. And, and so I think I'll just take the first and last there. Uh, uh, the SOT uh, test, uh, it's, uh, it's a multi-component uh, test, right? You, you, you describe it in, I think, paper one and your thesis, because uh, the sub, uh, patient 
or the subjects are measured in six different conditions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if I understand right, you can have a different, like a sub-scores or sub-scales. I mean, you, you have reading from each of the uh, conditions, right? And you can then calculate something that's called uh, like uh, vision ratio, this vestibular ratio and things like that from the test, is that right? Did you look at these scores if they were differently affected by your treatment or? Actually, I did not do that in my analysis. I only analyzed the uh, composite scores from all the different, yeah. different sensory conditions. Yeah. But, are, but are you going to look at that in the future? I could do that and mm. uh, if it's... What, what would that, uh, is it possible that would give you some extra information? Or? Yeah, it would give me an extra information regarding the effects of the multisensory balance training program on, uh, with regards to the effects <coughs> on, the, on the capability of using uh, information from the vestibular system or from the somatosensory system. Yeah. Yeah, or so. mm -hmm. I would think that would be very interesting, yeah, yeah. To, at least uh, to me. Uh, after all these discussions about the randomized control trial, things like that, have you thought about how you would uh, design your next randomized control trial on this? Uh, yes, I have done that. I <coughs> if if I would if if uh, this was to be repeated, this randomized. Uh, you may, you may Maybe, do you want to repeat it, or would you do a totally different uh, study, design it differently? I mean, that's basically what I'm asking. Do you, need, do you think you need to repeat this study, or would you do the next study totally different? Yeah, I would, uh, I would like to, to conduct a study uh, again on, on uh, elderly multivolers, and then I, I would definitely include a control group. And, uh, to like repeat the paper one with a control group? With a control group. And uh, enlarging the sample size. And uh, I would, I would uh, perform it in, in multiple centers for, for in, enforcing the generalization of the findings. Using uh, more than one therapist, than I guess? More, yeah, more than one therapist and, and more than one also more than one training facil uh, facilities. Yeah, excellent, excellent answer. Yeah. Um, I think I'm done. Thank you. And I thank you also for the presentation. Um, as I mentioned before, there is now an opportunity for a brief question or comments from the audience. If, yeah, yes, sir. I would definitely include people from 50 years of age if, if, I, were, if I was to repeat the case control study uh, because uh, there, there is a evidence that the age-related degenerative changes, for example, in the vestibular system, it starts between the age of 40 to 50 years, but uh, it is not general knowledge whether they have accumulated to that extent that they are, have started to affect their Postural, the, the, the postural performance. So I, I, I think it was, uh, it was good to, to have them that young. I, I would have them, uh, am I answering your question?
If you're in the treat in the treatment part, yes, there I th definitely I think the outcomes would have been uh, they would have gained more the, if if the 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 older the, they would have been, then it's more likely that age-related degenerative changes have affected more uh, their uh, both the function of the sensor systems and and the motor system and and also integration of sensory information in the central nervous system. So I think they would gain more from training uh, the, the older participants than the younger one. So I think I'll encourage more discussion in a little while because I think it would be a good idea for us now to adjourn for deliberation of the doctoral defense. So I would like to ask the audience to wait while the opponents and the members of the doctoral committee hold a brief conference. Gjør det så vel, Dr. Kjernstrøm og Gjør det